The subject this evening is a very important one because it seeks to establish, re-establish the truth of the Bible. You see, one of the biggest problems we have today is that people just listen to preachers and swallow everything they say without testing to see if it's true, if it is truth. See, I'm a preacher, but I want you to test it for yourself. That's why we made Bibles available when you come in. We want you to look it up. We want you to go home and compare it, scripture with scripture. You see, when it comes to matters of faith and your eternal destiny, you need to realize that you cannot rely upon anybody. Not, not your mom, not your dad, not anybody in your family. It has to be you. You alone will be the one who is accountable. See, the Bible warns us about this. And I'd like to invite you to read this with me. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. 1, 2, 3. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise what? Prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Why should we test all things and hold fast to what is good? Why is this important? Because the Bible predicts that there will be a lot of deception. The Bible predicts the very thing that is happening today. We find in 2 Timothy chapter 4, page 1186 in our seminar Bibles. 2 Tim Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. 1186 is the page. Second Timothy 4 verse 2. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. Long-suffering means patience. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap up heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned to fables they shall turn from what from the truth and turn to fables the greatest enemy of the Christian church is not the atheist or the outright sinner it's the hypocrite who prays and sings and yet he will not do the will of God or follow the word of God. We think that it's atheists. It's those who reject the Bible altogether, the greatest enemies of the Christian faith. It's the one who says he's a Christian, but does not do what the Bible says. It is this situation that has caused the Christian church to look so weak in the world. Today, people laugh at Christianity. It's a, it's a matter of jokes. Our young people are disgusted because they hear a lot of religion, but they do not see it acted out. To preachers, God says, preach the word. And it's not easy, you know. Everybody loves a preacher who preaches smooth things, who smiles a lot and makes everybody feel, feel nice. He says, it's all right to continue in your sin. God understands your sin. Everything's fine. You see, many people want God, but they want God to fit into their life. Instead, the Bible teaches we are to fit into His life. But the Bible says, woe to the preachers who compromises the truth to please people. And so whoever stands and preaches before others, he's under a curse if he does not preach the truth. Even if it hurts the people. Even if it makes them uncomfortable. You see, we're not to bring God's standard down to ourselves, to fit our lives. The standard of God remains high. The Bible does not need changing. People do. We need to be changed. I want us to look at a text that is very sobering, that is found in the book of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, page 953. 953. Book of Matthew, Gospel of Matthew 7, verse 21. 
9, uh, chapter 7, verse 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy, in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, work that ye that work iniquity. What kind of people are we talking about here? Those are believers. People who wanted to be saved. People who thought they were saved. People who referred to Jesus as their Lord. You see, a lot of religious people are going to be lost. Why? Why are they going to be lost? They did not do the will of their Father in Heaven. They did not do the will of God the Father. These are believers, they're just not obeyers. They believe, but their life shows differently. They went to church every week, they prayed, they preached, they did a lot of good things. In fact, they might not have been doing anything wrong. They just refused to do what was right. They did not do the will of the Father, and therefore they are lost. So probably the most important question we could ask tonight is this, what is the will of God? How can you know God's will? Well, let's look at a couple of verses. Let's go to the middle of the Bible, the book of Psalms. Psalm 40, verse 8, page 537. Psalm 40, verse 8, gives, there David gives us the answer. Page 537, Psalm 40, verse 8 says, I delight to do thy will. We're talking about God's will. Oh my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. What does David tell us? What is God's will? God's law. This verse says that God, God's will is his law. In the New Testament, Paul said the same thing in Romans chapter 2. Page 11, 18. Romans chapter 2, verse 18, page 11, 18, we find, this is what Paul says, Romans chapter 2, verse 18, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. How do we know God's will? By being instructed out of his will, out of... We know His will by being instructed out of His law. God's will is being instructed by His law. God's law is His will. Now I want to put up a text that may startle you. Okay. Let's read this together. Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. For the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land by swearing and lying, killing and stealing, and committing adultery. They break all restraints with bloodshed upon bloodshed. God has a problem with us. Why? Verse 6 tells us, My people are destroyed for what? Lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will re also will reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God. I also will forget your children. To me, that sounds very serious. Why is, does he have a problem? Because we have forgotten his law. I would suggest that the reason for all the prevailing corruption in Christian America today is because we have forgotten God's law and we are no longer doing the will of the Father. Now, all governments have laws. Would you agree with me? It is the will of the government that you obey the law. All societies have laws. It is the will of each society that you obey the law, its laws. Why? Because without law you have anarchy. Everybody doing what they want and it's chaos. So God gives us law also so that there will be harmony among his people. In fact, that is exactly what God wants. He wants harmony. harmony. Harmony between you and God, and harmony between you and man. You notice that the first 
four commandments deal with our relationship with God. The last six deal with our relationships with our fellow human beings, with our neighbor. And so they regulate our relationship with God and they regulate our, our relationships with, our, with one another. If we kept, if God's law was kept, there would be harmony between people and harmony between, between people and God. See, when we think of the law of God, we discover that it is, it is the only part of Scripture that God did not trust to men to um, write it. He wrote it himself with his own finger. The only part of Scripture that God wrote himself. He did not even trust Moses to write it. In fact, the Bible says it in Exodus chapter 31, page 83. Notice how, how it says it. In fact, God wrote it twice. The first time, Moses broke them. Then God says, Moses, you cut out the tablets, but I'm still going to write it. Exodus 31 and verse 18. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of the communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. That should make it important, wouldn't it? If God writes it with his own finger. Now friends, the devil hates God's law. He, since he is the first one who broke it, it has been his work to destroy God's law, and today he has almost done that. You see, in the early 1800s, you would find God's Ten Commandments in every school in every uh, courthouse, in every home, in every church, regardless of its name. God's Ten Commandments will be placed conspicuously up front so people would remember God's holy law. These, people, these principles were taught to our children in all society, but not anymore. Ever since they've been taken out of schools, out of, out of public places, these principle have, principles have been attacked and pushed aside. See, it reminds me of a story of a husband who was watching TV, he was sitting in his lazy boy in front of the TV. He gets really excited because he's watching this documentary about Israel and the Middle East and uh, the history of Israel. And then suddenly he jumps up in his living room. He calls his wife, honey, come over here. And she comes, you know, she, her hands still wet from the dishes. And she says, what? what? Honey, wouldn't it be wonderful? We buy a ticket to go to Mount Sinai. We stand on Mount Sinai and we'll just shout out the Ten Commandments from the top of Mount Sinai. Wouldn't that be nice? And she wasn't really faced. She just said, how about we stay at home and start keeping them? You know? We'd love to shout about it and, and put it up in places, but how about keeping it? Hey, beloved, it's, this is what Christian people are saying today. The law is no longer binding. It was nailed to the cross. Forget about the law. It's been nailed. It's been done away with. In this message, I would like us to um, find out, understand what it means when most people say the law does not apply to us. See, most, creatures, or most Christians and even preachers and pastors are saying that the law has been done away with. What does God mean when he says that most people will be lost because they did not do his will? It may surprise you to know that God's law has always existed. Even before he wrote it on the, on the tablets of stone on the Mount Sinai. In Genesis chapter 26, verse 5, we read, let's read it together. It's on the screen. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice, and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Abraham kept God's laws long before Sinai. And of course, there was Lucifer himself. He broke at least three commandments. The first commandment, because he wanted to be like God. It's the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Lucifer wanted to be like God. 
The ninth commandment, because he lied to the angels, you shall give no false testimony. But he lied about God. And the tenth commandment, because he coveted God's throne. Now let me ask you a question. If Lucifer was kicked out of heaven for breaking God's commandments, how do you think you and I will get there while breaking them? Does it make any sense? Let me, let's take a minute and see what the Bible says about God's law. Let's read it together. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. The law is truth. Now, if the law is truth, why would God want to do away with the truth? Psalm 119, and there verse 172. My tongue shall speak of your word, for all your commandments are righteousness. If God's law is righteousness, that's even the same thing. That, that's what, what New Testament says in Romans chapter 7, verse 2, page 1123. Paul tells us, Romans chapter 7, verse 12, page 1123. Romans 7, verse 12. Wherefore the law is holy, the commandment holy, and just and good. You see, very few things in the Bible are called, are called holy. But God's law is. God is holy, so is His law. And so we ought to be careful how we treat holy things. In fact, God's law and God Himself are very familiar. Let us look at this next slide and these different references. Notice how it says, God is spirit, or God is spiritual. His law is spiritual. Romans 7 verse 14. God is love, 1 John 4, verse 8. His, God, his, love, his law is love, Matthew 22, 37 to 40. God is truth, His law is truth. God is righteousness, He's righteous, His law is righteous. God is holy, His law is holy. He, God is perfect, His law is perfect. God stands forever, His law stands forever. God is good, His law is good. We just read that. God is just, His law is just. God is pure, His law is pure. God is unchangeable. His law is unchangeable. You see, God's law is really a transcript of His character. What is God like? Look at the law. It will tell you what God is like. You see, we want to see what everyone in the Bible talks about the law. So let's look at what Jesus had to say on this topic. What did Jesus have to say on the topic of the law? Let's turn to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, page 950, 950. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. See, there was a lot of conversation when Jesus started preaching that has he come to take away the law? Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, page 950. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. Notice this. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one yacht, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Who shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven but whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven in other words you either be in heaven or you won't that's what it's saying but until heaven and earth pass away this law is not going to be changed the next time you are either tempted to think that God's law has been done away with I want you to do something for me I want you to, to go outside, stomp your feet. If the, if the earth is still there, God's law is still there too. If the sky is still above us, God's law still applies. Notice Psalm 111, 7 to 8. Let's read together. The work of His hands are verity and judgment. All His precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. How long is God's law for? forever and ever let me approach it this way how many of you believe that there is sin in the world right I mean it's what a question if you answer that question with a yes 
then the law has not been done away with. Why? I'll prove it to you. 1 John 3 verse 4 tells us, Sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is the transgression of the law. If there is no law, there is no sin. You just told me there is sin. There is law too. How do you know there is sin? The law tells us this is sinful. Romans 4 verse 15 tells us, Because the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. There are states where it's okay to ride a motorcycle without a helmet, like Texas. But you cross the state line and you go to a place like, I don't know, Michigan. You have to wear a helmet. But in Indiana, there's no law for the helmets. So it's not, a, it's not an infraction. It's not, a, it's, it's not punishable. You see, where there is no law, there is no transgression. There is no sin. That is why I believe tr the devil is trying so hard to do away with God's law. You see, if he can do away with God's law, then he has done away with sin. Anything goes. Nothing is wrong. So the very fact that we have sin tells us there must be a law. So it's impossible and even irrational even to suggest that God's law has been done away with. That it doesn't exist anymore. So the next thing we need to know, what is the purpose of the law? Romans 3.20 tells us, uh, page 1119, 3... 20. Oh yeah, I just passed it. Romans 3.20 tells us, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. By the law is the knowledge of sin. That's the purpose of God's law. For you and me to be able to say, I see, that is a sin. It, the law cannot justify or save you. If you could be justified just by obeying God's law, Jesus will not have to die. But it's, the law cannot save you. It's not its purpose. If, what is it for? It gives us a knowledge of sin. The law simply tells you what you should and you should not do. It's like a red light. Have you ever uh, come up to a, to, a, to a traffic light and you know that uh, Traffic on the traffic from the from across is having a red light, but somebody speeds right across. You see, a red light tells you you should not go for you should not go forward. The red light will not stop your car; it will just tell you you should not be going. You ought to stop. You cannot blame the red you cannot blame the traffic light for having a car wreck if you ignore it. The red light is there just to tell you stop that's what the law does so what's the other purpose of the law turn to James James chapter 1 page 1201 James chapter 1 page 1201 James chapter 1 and there we read from verse 23 to 25 For, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in all he does. You see, the law is like a mirror. You come in front of a mirror and you look at it yourself and you realize, oh, the hair is a mess. Oh, I got dirty on, on this side of my face. Will the mirror clean you? No, it can't. It's not its purpose. It just, its purpose is to tell you there is a spot. Oh, this hair is sticking out. You see, God's law is like a mirror. The purpose of the mirror is to make me aware that I have dirt and I need to wash it, wash it away. If I, want clean, if I want to get clean, I need to get cleansing from Jesus. I go to Jesus. The, really mirror, the mirror, does me, mirror does me a favor, really. Tells me, you need to go and be cleansed by Jesus. So I get cleansed by the blood of Christ. And I come back to the same mirror. And the same mirror tells me, now you look, you look okay. Now you are clean. 
Let's make it practical. Here's a man cheating on his wife. He looks into a mirror and the mirror tells him you shall not commit adultery. It tells him he's got dirt in his life and what does he do then? He goes to Jesus. He's cleansed, forgiven and justified. When he comes back, he looks at the mirror and says, you are clean. Because your sin has been taken away by Jesus. Romans chapter 8, page 1123. Romans chapter 8 and there verse 1. This is how Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. A man could have been committing adultery, could have killed someone, but has come to Jesus for forgiveness, for cleansing. He has repented, he has turned himself to Jesus. He can then confidently say, there is now no condemnation for them which are in Christ Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? All your past is forgiven. That's the purpose of the law. Alright, so there's a question. If we are not saved by the law, then why should we keep it? If we are not saved by God's law, why should we keep it? Let's turn to the Gospel of John. Let's go to the left couple of pages. John chapter 14, page 1068. John 14 verse 15 tells us why we should keep God's, keep God's law. John 14 verse 15 If you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Let's skip down to verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them he is he it is that loveth me and he that loveth me shall be loved by my father loved of my father and i will love him and will manifest myself to him jesus says do you love me keep my commandments the ten commandments are simply a test of love do we love god or sin which of the two john said, said the same thing in first john chapter 5 verse 2 to 3 Let's read it on a screen. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Love is keeping God's commandments, and they are not hard. If there's love in the heart, you will keep His commandments. Next time a preacher tells you, the God's law has been done away with. Go to the back of his sanctuary and take all the offering that has been collected and run away with it. And when he complains, say, well, uh, God's law has been done away with. It's not stealing anymore. Nobody likes to have, have anything stolen from. But that's exactly what God's, what God's commandments say. Do not steal. Here's a very solemn text. 1 John 2, 3-4. Now, by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. If people say that they know God, and they don't keep his commandments, they are liars and don't have the truth. Simple as that. Some people say, well, all you have to do is believe. Well, you know... The, gospel, the, book of the, letter, the epistle of James tells, James tells us, you believe there is one God, you do well. Even the, dem, the demons believe and tremble. Satan and the, de, and the de, demons, they believe that there is God, they believe that there is Christ, but it won't help them anything. Because they do not obey. Belief has to be coupled with faith. Let's look at the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, that we are trying to unlock. Revelation chapter 14 verse 12 tells us something, how to identify God's people. A lot of people claim to be God's people, but book of Revelation tells us who are really God's people. Revelation chapter 14 and the verse 12, page 1228. 
Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. There are two things. You see, God has just destroyed the wicked in verses 9 to 11. And who is left? Commandment keepers. Let's read on in Revelation 22, verse 14. That's the last page of the Bible, of the book of Revelation. Revelation 22, verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates to this, into the city. Commandment keepers are the ones who go into the new city, Jerusalem. The ones who keep God's commandments. Now that we have this broad picture about the commandments, you're probably wondering, why is there so little of the Ten Commandments being taught these days in churches? You hear about everything else but about God's law. Why are the Ten Commandments said to be done away with? The Bible gives us an answer in the book of Daniel, the very prophecy we studied a couple of nights ago. You remember the prophecy of the mark of, of the, about the beast power? That the little horn, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, it says, one of the things that he will try to do is, he shall speak great words against the Most High, in other words, the blasphemies against God, and we define what blasphemy is, and he shall do something else. He shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to do what? To change times and laws. Here is the real, real issue. The two sides are warring for the control of your will. On the one side is the Antichrist, on the other side is Jesus Christ. Antichrist has done away with and changed God's laws. And our world is, is filled with, the, with its results. War, crime and immorality. Most of the world today is following the Antichrist. Jesus Christ stands on the other side and is inviting us. If you love me, keep my commandments. Solomon, the wise man, summed it all up in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. If you could summarize it, the conclusion, this is what it is. Fear God and keep what? His commandments, for that is man's all. God says, I love you. I'm taking care of your sins. If you love me, keep my commandments. All of this seems so clear. Then what is the problem? Well, I want to take a few moments and try and confuse you, if I haven't done it so far. How many of you have heard that the Ten Commandments have been done away with? Have you heard that? How many of you have heard that they have been nailed to the cross? Some of you have heard it? That we are living under a new covenant, not under law anymore. Well, let's read the three main verses that are used by people to claim that God's law has been done away with. Besides these, we will read four or five other verses which establish God's law. They will help us understand why some people think that we do not have to keep God's law. Let's read James 2, verse 10 to 12. Let's read it together. For whoever shall keep the whole law, yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. And if, now if you do commit adultery, do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Okay, that one seems to uh, establish God's law. How about this one? Second, Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 to 16. Let's read that one. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them, so that no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival, new moons or Sabbaths. Here, God's loss seems to have been nailed to the cross. How about Matthew 5, 17 to 19? We read it already before. Let's read it. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. 
Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So they seem to contradict. Notice this one. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. It seems like it's going back and forth, like the Bible seems to be saying two different things. One has been done away with, and the other one, he says, I've come to establish it, I've fulfill it. It will not be taken away. Notice John, 1 John 2, 3 to 4. Now, by this we know, if he, now that, by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments, he who says, I know him, and does not, not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not, in, is not in him. But then again, we have Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. So how in the world do you reconcile, reconcile all these verses? Which is it, after all? Friends, there's a simple answer to this. The Bible talks about two laws. God's law of Ten Commandments and Moses' law, or the law of ordinances. See, let's, let's look at them individually. First one, God's law was written by whom? By God, how? With God's finger. On what? Was placed inside of the ark. Inside of the box, the ark of the covenant. It was called the Ten Commandments. Moses' law, on the other hand, was written by whom? Moses. With his handwriting, in a book, it was placed in the side of the ark, not inside. It was called the book of the law. It was against the people. It dealt with things like Passover, wave sheep offerings, meat and drink offerings, and ceremonial Sabbath days. The Ten Commandments, the God's law was the Ten Commandments found in Exodus chapter 20. And this law, written by God's finger, was placed into the Ark of the Covenant. Turn with me, or let's look at Deuteronomy. Well, wait, I skipped Exodus 31. Then the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai. He gave him the two tablets of the testimony, which is the Ten Commandments. The tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. And then we read in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 1, and 1 to 2. At that time the Lord said to me, Hew for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and come up to me on the mountain and make yourself an ark of wood. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke, and you shall put them in the ark. What, which law is this? Moses' law or God's law? God's law. It is the Ten Commandments that he wrote with his own finger. Now secondly, Moses' law was written in a book. Deuteronomy 31, we read, So Moses wrote law, wrote this, this, this wrote law, I think there's a typo, right? Wrote this law and delivered it to the priests. And the sons of Levi, who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. So it was when Moses had completed writing the words of this law, how? In a book, not on the stone tablets. When they were finished, and Moses commanded the Levites who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this law, take the book of this, take this book of the law, and put it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, that it may be there as a witness against you. This is a very important phrase, witness against you. Because it will appear in the verse that we read just, in, just a while ago. Moses' law was written by whom? Moses. It was his handwriting, then placed by the, on the side of the ark. It was against the people. It was called the book of the law. Does this begin to make any sense? Now Moses' law can be read in, in, for the most part in Leviticus chapter 23. It dealt with ceremonies, sacrifices, feast days, ceremonial Sabbaths, Sabbath days, meat and drink offerings. All these 
sacrifices, all these ceremonies pointed toward whom? Toward Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. He was the substance of all that Moses' law pointed forward to. In other words, Moses' law and all its requirements was to lead the people to look forward to when the promised Messiah would come and he would be the ultimate fulfillment of all these laws, all these ceremonies. And so literally when Jesus hung on the cross, he said it is finished, all these laws, all these ceremonies, the, the book of law, the law of Moses, was literally nailed to the cross because Jesus was the embodiment of all these laws. What happened when Jesus died on the cross? Then the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, signifying that the temple has lost its, lost its significance. In fact, its significance became fulfilled when Jesus died on the cross. No longer was there need for sacrifices. No longer was there need to point people to a future sacrifice because that sacrifice was right now hanging on the cross on Calvary. With this background, we are prepared to re-examine these couple of verses that were in question earlier. Once again, let's review. God's law written by God, Moses' law written by Moses. God's law was written with God's finger. Moses' law was the handwriting. That's all, it's also an important phrase, the handwriting. God's law on stone, Moses is on, in a book. God's law placed inside of the ark it was the most precious part in the sanctuary, the most holy place. Moses' law placed in, in the, on the side of the ark. God's law called the Ten Commandments. Moses' law called the Book of the Law. It was against the people. It dealt with things like the Passover, wave sheave offerings, meat and drink offerings, and ceremonial Sabbath days. Let's read it again, Colossians 2, verse 14 to 6. Having wiped out the what? Handwriting, Handwriting of requirements that was what? Against us. What is it talking about? God's law or Moses' law? Right? It was against us which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in what? Food or in drink or regarding a festival or new moon or Sabbaths. This is talking about all these things that would take place at the sanctuary. Food and drink offerings. Sometimes you would drink, bring an offering of, of fresh, grape pressed grape juice and pour it out before the Lord. I don't know if you've ever drank fresh pressed grape juice. Welch's doesn't even compare to that. But there was a symbol of Jesus, of His blood that would be shed in the future. They would also bring uh, oil that would be poured out. That would be also called a drink offering. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15. That's, that's the other problem text. Having abolished in the flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in what? Ordinances. What were the ordinances? Ordinances, sacrifices, Passover, Pentecost, wave sheep offerings, all these things that would happen around the sanctuary. So as to create in himself a new man from the two, thus making peace. See, the same goes for Ephesians 2.15. As long as one keeps those two laws separate, there is no confusion. God's Ten Commandments law is eternal. It's forever and ever. Moses' law was temporary until when? Until Jesus came and He paid for our sins. He fulfilled it and thus it was done away with. When he, when he, just before He died, He said, It is finished. The sanctuary services were finished. They still continued for years after that because they didn't catch what happened. In Moses' law, there was a Day of Atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles. We studied the Day of Atonement uh, just a couple of nights ago when we talked about the Day of Judgment. Um, there was, it, was, it dealt with the Feast of Tabernacles. There was circumcision. There was the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, peace offerings, burnt offerings, and the Jubilee. See, Christ fulfilled all of these. They were all part of Moses' law, and one can easily see the difference between God's law and Moses' law. You see, we can do no more, no more do away with God's Ten Commandment law than we can do away with God Himself. Because as we have seen God's Ten Commandments, he, God's law, ha bears the same attributes as, as He does. We read, we read in a verse earlier that 
God's law is perfect. If something is perfect, can you change it and it still be perfect? Once it's changed, it's not perfect anymore. God's Ten Commandments is a transcript of His character. Alright, now that this is clear, let us go on. So what does it mean when the Bible says, we are not under the law, but under grace? Remember we read, read this? Let's turn to Romans chapter 6, verse 14. Page 1122. Romans 6, verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. But does this mean we don't have to keep Paul, realizing that some people might ask this question, he wrote the next verse. What then? Shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid! What does it mean not to be under law, but under grace? Let me give you an example. Real life example. I was visiting some uh, place close to Dallas and I was driving back home on 281, just north of Edinburgh. And because it takes about eight hours to drive all the way to the valley, it was really, really late. It was almost, almost midnight. And I just want to get home, you know, go home and just sleep. I'm coming up towards San Manuel, Lynn, and you know, there's a bridge, and somehow my foot goes heavier than usual. I don't realize that I'm going over the speed limit. But I'm thinking, you know, it's the middle of the night, nobody's, nobody's there, it's, it's, a, it's an empty road. Suddenly, I realize those red and blue lights behind me. You know, my heart sinks. I, mean, I have a perfect record for the last couple of years. <sighs> okay, I started taking out my wallet, my driver's license. It's a lady, a state trooper. She asked me, well, where are you going? Well, I'm going here. She asked me, could you please step out, step out of the vehicle? I said, sure. Uh, she asked me, so where are you going? There, I'm, where are you coming from? The so and so. What do you do? What kind of occupation do you have? I'm a pastor. Oh, really? What kind of church? What kind of a church? Well, I tell them about my church. Well, what do you believe? Well, I really I pray to the Lord. Say, Lord, it would be a better time to speak about these things than being caught for speeding. Well, I tell her, and I and I and I told her I really apologize. I'm, you know, I'm. It's late, and I guess I just didn't pay attention to the speed. And she said, okay. She go, She went back into the car. She comes out with a warning. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, please be careful. This is, it was still before they raised the speed limit. It was 65 at night. What do you think? I got into the car and sped off? I went down 70 on 281? No, I had just received grace. I had received grace. I went 55 all the way home, thanking the Lord and the state trooper for not giving me what I deserved. And so now that we are not under law, but we are under grace, we have been forgiven. All the more reason to keep His commandment. You see, one of, the, one of the, my favorite passages is found in 1 John chapter 5, verse 2 to 3. We read this already twice. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not burdensome. You see, we are not under the law, we are under grace, which obliges us even more to keep His commandments. Because of the grace which He extended to us, He tells us, if you love me, now that what, I, what I've done for you on Calvary, as a response to that, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now you see, there's a lot of people who do not want to leave or forsake their sin. They usually say at this point, well, all that stuff is all old covenant. We are now under a new covenant. Have you heard this one? Well, let's see what the Bible talks, says about that. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, page 1196. Hebrews chapter 10. If we are now under the new covenant, what does that mean? Hebrews 10 verse 15. 
whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. That's a new covenant. Say the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. The new covenant is not doing away with God's law. It is writing God's law into our hearts. In the old covenant, where was God's law? It was in the Ark of the Covenant. And people had a hard time putting it into practice. In the new covenant, God says, I will make, it sh make sure that my law will be written on their hearts. They will treasure it here. Whenever they will feel tempted like stealing, their conscience, my Holy Spirit, will tell them, don't do that. Whenever they feel tempted like cheating on a spouse, the Holy Spirit will tell them, don't do that. That's what it means to have God's law written in your heart. When His law is in our heart, it will be natural for us to obey it. Because we love Him. Wherever you go in the Bible, God's Ten Commandment law is upheld. I would like to read just a couple of verses to you. 1 John 2, verse 3 and 4. Page 12, 11. 1 John 2, verse 3 and 4. And hereby we do know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. He that saith, I know Him, and keepeth not His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. James 2, verse 10 to 12. We read it before, let's read it again. Uh, page 1201, James 2. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he, he that said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not kill. Now if you commit adult, no adultery, but if you, if you do kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak he, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. God's law, God's Ten Commandments, is referred to as the law of liberty. Why? Because it's, it frees you from being a slave to sin. Jesus' death cleanses you. And His law of liberty protects you from being tempted by Satan. Protects you from doing something that will harm you and harm those around you. It preserves harmony with, with our fellow neighbor. Preserves harmony with God. Revelation 12, verse 17. This is a good one. 12, uh, page 1227. Revelation 12, verse 17. This is the last verse of that chapter. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. Later on we'll find out that the dragon is the devil. Who does the devil hate? Whom is he upset with? And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Or those that are left over from God's people. Which do what? Keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Two pages to the right. Revelation 14 verse 12. This same phrase is repeated in different words. And I look, uh, 14 verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Friends, God's law is a wonderful blessing. It's like a wall of protection. James tells us if you break one of the commandments, you've break the, broken them all. If, you have a, if a city is walled for protection, if they make a breach in a wall in one place, the whole city is in danger. Satan is trying to break into our homes, break into our lives. And if we keep God's commandments, they are a protection from Satan causing havoc in our lives. God, Jesus said, he upheld these commandments. He says, these commandments will not be taken away. These commandments are here for your protection. They are a wonderful blessing. These are promises of, of God's blessing. The more you come into harmony with them, the happier you will be. In the fight of the century, there is men trying to do away with God's commandments, with God's law. The beast and those who follow it stand on one side. On the other side stands God's true-filled com commandment-keeping saints. In one blow, the beast and its followers are defeated. 
That's what the book of Revelation tells us. And those who remained are those who followed Jesus and kept his commandments. Today, which side will you be on? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Do you want to keep his commandments? Amen. I would like to invite you to stand as we ask him to lead us to obey his law. Because we are under the grace. Because we are in a new covenant, he writes them into our hearts. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have loved us so much that you sent your son Jesus to die for us on the cross. He died so that he can fulfill the demands of the law regarding our sins. Father, thank you that your law is a hedge of protection from the attacks of the enemy. Thank you that your law is just and good and it tells us about your character. Father, it cannot cleanse us, it cannot fix us. It is your job, it is what Jesus does. But Lord, it, it points us to you, it helps us to realize the problems in our lives and turn to you and say, Lord, change me. Lord, we want to know you, we want to love you. And you said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so, we want to tell you tonight that we love you and we want to keep your law, keep your commandments. As the prophecies have predicted that your law will be changed, done away with, we realize that Satan is working really hard to try and draw people's attention away from your law. Help us to follow you just like Abraham who kept your law, just like Jesus, just like all the apostles. We put ourselves into your hands. We ask you for your protection over us tonight as we go home and bring us safely tomorrow night as we continue studying your word. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.